how to price. So what are the determinants of value? And you know, um, Mike was saying, I'm an appraiser. I've been in the valuation field for 30 years. Uh, and so uh, when I look for, you know, what are the things I look for in determining value? Well, the number one is past sales. Past sales, are, the, are your sales as an artist, are your sales listed? And people say to me, Elizabeth, what does listed mean? Listed means that there is a public forum such as the reportage by auction houses of your work that has sold through their houses. Um, and some of the sites I use to research that, so the, the, the quality is, are you a listed artist? In other words, is there a track record outside of the gallery? If you work with the gallery or you sell independently, they aren't listed values publicly, but auction values are all public. I don't know if you're old enough to remember, but uh, I was at Christie's in Manhattan when there was the Sotheby's and Christie's lawsuit, class action suit in the 80s. I was a young intern there and it changed the art world. So um, the, the research material I use, some really good sites I use, p4a.com, and this is to research, Have you are you listed? Have, has somebody picked up a work of yours at auction or has somebody picked up a work of yours and listed it? Um, uh, Artnet, Artsy, Mutual Art, and Artsy and Mutual Art do pick up gallery sales. Invaluable, Art Price, and Ask Art. All those are really good websites to research value. In other words, if you, if you have sold something, you're going to see yourself there. Two branches of the basis of market value. What are the two branches? Well, number one is the physical characteristics of your object. And number two is the connoisseurship element. So one is quality, one is quantity, basically. But there's a third branch, which is kind of recent. And uh, I started to represent a client who bought photography at Art Basel in 2005. And that was my first uh, Art Basel Biennale in, in Miami. And I was being paid to buy for the, this client. And I started to realize uh, at Art Basel that the third branch of market value is celebrity status. What do I mean by that? Well, it could be a celebrity subject. It could be a celebrity photographer, or it could be a notable event that was being photographed in time. So celebrity makes a big difference in the valuation. Uh, and it's called provenance, by the way, in my, in my business. Then finally, uh, when a, an artist will come and say to me, you know, I, I want to know how to price my work. What's the best method? My best advice is you use a comparative method. So you match. It's called a matching comparative method. So what you do is you say, okay, here are my teachers. Here are my styles. Here's the size I work in. Here's the medium I work in. My typical composition is X. My subject matter is X. And I compare those areas with the works of other photographers who have the same similarities. And I have a little codicil here. This does not mean that you're looking for photographers to compare yourself with whose work looks like yours, but you're using those market indices to understand. And a really important indices, uh, indice is who you, who you were taught by. Uh, which has really nothing to do with the look of your objects. Um, but, but we'll just very quickly, teachers, styles, size, medium, composition, subject matter. And you compare those things with the work of other photographers who have a similar market presence. Uh, so maybe they've sold a few times at auction, or maybe they're represented by a fairly reputable dealer, or maybe they're just breaking into the gallery world. So you would use that market level as the bottom end of the fraction. The top end, the top of the fraction are the things I mentioned. And then market level is, is the bottom end. Now, number two, how the market sets a value on your work. Well, they set a value of, on your work by previous sales, but there's a catch 22. And I will tell you what that is. Uh, little later on. I've got a whole subject devoted to catch 22 in, in the auction world. Market sets a value on previous sales, your track record, by what collections you're in. Big thing, when I write an appraisal, uh, and that's a big value point. Who has purchased you? Big value point. By subject matter, you know, is the work uh, purchased mostly for tourist value? Is it a landscape? Is it a natural wonder scene, et cetera? 
Um, so the markets has different categories of value based on genre. That's changing. Very recently, portrait work started to become important in the market. That's a very recent development. And number in number E, by those who have commissioned you for portraits, weddings, events, et cetera, et cetera, that have a certain level in society, if you're if you're that kind of photographer. Number three, how and where customers buy professional photography. Where do they buy? Well, they buy in a gallery, but it's so amazing to me in 30 years of doing this, when I have an estate, we, somebody mentioned before we started about insurance, I'm representing four law firms, one in uh, Malibu, one in Paradise, one in, um, in the, in the uh, what do you call it, Dix Dixie Fire area, one here in Santa Barbara. So I do a lot of court work. And um, these are about fire damages and insurance claims, et cetera. So it's been interesting when I do an insurance uh, review, when people are dropped from their insurance company, they call me because they need a new review for their new insurer. And I do their art collection, photography. I do fine art of all kinds. And I do um, collectible furniture and antiques and silver and porcelain, all sorts of things. The interesting thing is if they buy photography, they don't buy it in their hometown. They don't buy it in the town in which they live. They buy it in different, like, like a souvenir of, of, of a trip, for example. They don't necessarily buy it from their local gallery. They also buy from art fairs of all market levels and they buy from auctions. My clients who are connoisseurs buy a lot at auction. Uh, and they buy private sales from the artist's own studio. And they love to do that because they get to talk with the artists. They get to understand how the artist works. And they also don't have to pay the gallery commission lots of times because the artist will say, okay, you know, my, my normal price to, the, to my gallery is X, but I'm going to give it to you for my bro, bro price. Um, and then my, my footnote on this is, as an artist, you want to understand what, how the market looks at the difference between G-Clay and edition series. A very important value difference, G-Clay is typically not editioned. And the edition series, uh, the, the six artists that I'm gonna talk to you about, they all edition their work. All They all edition their work and they keep the editions low. Now, we can also talk about, if you want, we can talk a little bit about how artists get around the concept of the low edition because they say, Elizabeth, if I keep my edition to 30, uh, I'm not gonna make any money. But the way that the um, photography world is changing now is that if you have an edition that's in a certain size, in a certain format, let's say it's ectochrome, whatever, and you, you've got this, this is an X size in ectochrome, or it's a C, chrome, C print, and it's in this size. If you change your uh, medium and your size, that counts as a new edition. That's just the... You didn't hear it from me, but a lot of photographers use that little trick because they don't want to limit their edition to 30, that it's, you know, the sales are not as great. As it happens, the appraised value is greater if the lower the edition number though. So it's a matter of selling versus how, how the person who's collecting you in 10 years is going to increase in value. Number four, here's what matters in the physical aspects of the work. Believe it or not, size, size. And, and, and I have a lot of photographers come to me. They've got a huge, great, big, beautiful print. It's hard to sell a large piece. Um, size matters. Celebrity of subject, celebrity locations and uh, the locations themselves. Um, also, and I should introduce this guy that's walking behind me is my partner, John, who's a professional photographer. <laughs> so John says hi. Um, uh, uh, number oh, se sentiment or memory is also important. Specificity of location is important to people. Time period is important. In other words, what, you know, is this, is this an old print from the, from the seventies that you're, you know, revising and reprinting now? They may love that. Uh, event is important and the person is important. 
Now, if you're a portrait artist, uh, the important factors that I can see in my, um, my travels as an appraiser, important factors, flattering lighting, flattering positions, inclusion of all relevant parties. I remember um, being at a wedding with a very famous wedding photographer shooting uh, and um, the mother of the bride was furious because this photographer neglected to get the, the, the bride's, um, the bride's uh, brother in one of the photos. She apparently fired him on the spot. Um, note, at the end of this, my footnote to this is composition and artistry and skill in my experience, are not always as relevant as physical characteristics. I don't understand that, but it's true. Composition, artistry, and skill are not always as relevant as physical characteristics. Well, what I mean by that is, is the documentary nature of photography. So, um, so let's say you're an event photographer. Uh, the composition, artistry, and skill may not be as important as getting that brother in the shot with the bride. And we're going to talk a little bit the, 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 at, towards the end about the real dichotomy in the world of photography today, where it's a circle back to the 19th century. Is photography um, art or is it document? And this comment of mine applies more to the document side of, of photography, but even if it's fine art photography, there's a document side. And so people may be more interested in the subject than they are in the artistry and skill. And, and, and you asked me to talk about why people buy or commission, for example, in this case, uh, a lot of it has to do with the document end. Number five, here's the difference between auctions, galleries, and art fairs. Auctions must have a track record for this is for you to sell at auction. And how, how you become a listed artist is to sell at auction, basically. And you can, if, if you do gallery sales, you can, and there's ways to ways to overcome it. But the, the way that um Auction results are always public and always published. That means that anybody can look you up and see your track record at auction. But for you to sell at auction, you have to have a track record of your other auction sales to let you in, so to speak. And that's the catch-22. So the artists say to me, well, I can't, I can't give a work of mine to an auction because I don't have a track record of selling an auction. So how do I even start? My clue to you would be, uh, well, I'm going to talk in the next point about what my clues are to overcome that catch-22, so hang on to that thought. Now, auctions can sign. They sell at various sales achievement levels, and they give you a percentage. That means they take a percentage from 500 to 2,000. The seller and buyer split 20%. 20% is what the auction house gets to, to represent you. Now that's opposed to galleries that take 50 to 60% to represent you. So uh, let's keep on going with that. From 2,000 to 5,000, there's a 15 to 12% split between the buyer and the seller. And the auction house takes that. And from 5,000 to 10,000, there's a 10% split and the auction house gets that 10%. So a lot of artists love to sell at auction, but the catch-22 we're going to talk a little bit more about is if you haven't sold at auction before, an auction house is very reticent to take your work. And number two, since COVID, auction houses have been doing so well that there is no reserve anymore. What's a reserve? A reserve is where you say, I'm not selling my work unless it gets over 5,000 or 2,000 or what have you. You put a reserve and the auction house is then going to pull the work if it doesn't achieve over that. They don't do that anymore. Uh, they just are making too much money. So um, let's see, galleries either buy the work outright or they sell on a consignment commission, which when let's say it's an outright purchase is usually a price one third to one half of what they can sell it for. And if consigned, it's 50 to 60% upon sale to the gallery. 
So if you're rep, if you want to be represented by a gallery, you have to be prepared that you're going to offer the uh, something to the gallery. Let's say at two thousand, and they're going to hang it on the wall for four thousand five hundred to five thousand. Okay, art fairs. Well, art fairs cost money too. There's the cost of your booth. There's a juried entry sometimes that costs. Uh, there's framing, hauling, and insurance. That is all cost. Number six, the catch-22 of auction sales. Like I said, an auction house won't sell your work unless they or a similar market have sold you before. The exceptions. If the piece has terrific provenance, for example, if it was once owned by a celebrity or it's a subject that's extremely rare and one of a kind, Let's say, you know, you're the first guy to, sh to shoot, let's say, um, the, fir the first firefighter in the Malibu, in the Wolsey fire saving, you know, somebody's dog, let's say. Um, if it's once owned a subject that is extremely rare, one of a kind, the auctions will grab it, um, then they might sell the work. And this is my little note to you, charity auctions don't count. So charity auctions do not have to report a sale the same way auction houses do. A work on, uh, in an auction is important post-COVID is that's where much of the fine art action is. And I want to tell you exactly what I mean by that. Photography and art at auction is blazing hot right now. Sotheby's in 2021. Can you guess how many dollars they made? 7.3 billion in one year on fine art and photography. Two auction houses, 7.3 bill. This is the highest yearly earning in 277 years at Sotheby's. Now in, um, there's every, every year there's an annual publication that all appraisers uh, look out for and must read. And that's the UBS, Union Bank of Switzerland Art Market Report. They came out with a report 2022 to three, and they reported that the art and photography world has been rocked by turbulence, inflation fears, the long tail of COVID, supply chain issues, crypto issues, and volatility. Yet, the sales at the main auction houses were up 3%, 3% more than 7.3 billion. And the other point is that smaller auction houses are doing very well in specialized sales. And what I mean by that is a lot of the smaller auction houses have said, God, the big boys, we can't compete with Sotheby's and Christie's. So we're going to form our own consortiums. And a really good uh, consortium for fine art photography and modern photography, contemporary photography, modern master photography is going to be Los Angeles Modern Auctions. And they united with Rago and Wright. Rego was in the, on the East Coast and Wright was in my hometown of Chicago. And they united with those, those three. They all do contemporary photography. And um, the other factor is the market right now is very event driven. And I think it's because people were so starved for the social end of art openings and fairs and gallery openings and auctions. They were starved for that during COVID. So a, there's a lot of events around art and photography that are happening in which photography is being sold. Um, uh, people love to buy biennales and shows, et cetera, et cetera, because they're all coming back and they're really sexy right now. All the biennales are fantastic. Um, number seven, where does photography fit in the art world today? Well, it's back to the future in an old dichotomy. So let's think about the mid 19th century, the birth of, of photography. Consumers and buyers begin to ask, and also publications, is this a work of art? You know, I'm thinking of Cameron, Julia Cameron, I'm thinking of many Steichen, I'm thinking of early, early photographers. Is it, is it a work of art? Is it a document? Well, you know, think of both sides and the both sides are still at war today. And another similarity to the art document dichotomy in photography, which was seen in the mid 19th centuries and is seen again today. And you'll see this in the work of the six photographers that I'm about to show you. 
the outre and the scandalous subject matter still is important. Uh, I want to bring your mind back. If you studied um, history of photography, uh, I did for, for years and years. Uh, um, and the history of photography, there used to be this thing that uh, um, Newhall's book would always talk about the uh, dead baby photograph. And that's, you know, people would document the child that died in 1860, 1870. And it was scandalous, and uh, but it was done, and it was you know treasured. Well, you've got that. Compare that to the disruptor or the highly sexualized photos of today that sell. So it's it's similar. It's it, I think it's a research. It's a it's it's a return to this dichotomy. And you know um, I think Mark asked me to to in, in elaborate on the idea that you've got what the picture is of versus the artistry of it. So you've got that same tension between the art and the, and the uh, documentation properties of photography. Number eight, and maybe um, we can look at those six photos. Okay, so this is Milton Barrel. It's 1986 by Andy Warhol. The size is 27 by 31, it's signed and dated. It's being offered, it's uh, the final hammer is going down um, in two days, but it's being offered on Artnet in the Contemporary Art Auction that's online now at Artnet. Artnet is a great a resource, by the way, for both selling and selling your work and buying others, other people's work. Hammer comes down June 14th, which means the auction is closed. At this moment, when I was putting this together this afternoon, uh, the bidding was, was at 32 thousand dollars and it wasn't meeting the reserve in other words we don't know we never know what the reserve is but the reserve is going to be over thirty two thousand it's probably closer to thirty five thousand and this is a smaller work um and it is a image that andy um i don't know if you can see the stitching he did a series of, of, of silver gelatin photos where he stitched them together with silver thread and um, so these, you know, little tiny silver gelatin uh, from the 1980s. And it's because he was on the show called The Love Boat. And I can't believe this. Andy Warhol was on a show called The Love Boat with Milton Berle. And he was intrigued by Milton Berle. And he took these, you know, candid photos, stitched them together. And um, they were offered for sale in the 80s at Warhol's gallery, Mil uh, Robert, sorry. Robert Miller Gallery, which was Andy's favorite gallery. And it, it this sold at the time. And then it resold the last show Andy ever did before he died at Robert Miller. So what do we have here that's the factors in valuation? We have celebrity, double celebrity. We've got the importance of a first show and a last show in the artist's career. We have the theme that Andy loved, which is uh, mass media. So he did this for TV on TV. And you see uh, the provenance is building and building and building here. And so the value is affected by the provenance. Okay, let's go on to the next one. This is uh, Robert Maplethorpe. Right below this is Maplethorpe. Okay, a beautiful piece by Maplethorpe. Uh, I think the composition is incredible. I think the symmetry is, is remarkable. I think the, the whole, uh, presentation. Um, it's Maplethorpe called Orchid. It's 32 by 31, signed and numbered in, a, in an edition of 30. It's number 19th edition of 30. Anybody familiar with photogravure? This is a 19th century process called photogravure that he is playing with. And it's a flat, sort of a flat tonalities. Every, you know, it's not as vivid as far as contrast. And he liked that. And uh, why is he carrying forth a 19th century theme in his medium? That's part of the value because what he's saying, he's hearkening back to the era of still life, first botanicals in the 19th century. Um, um, oh, I'm going to forget now. The British photographer who started off with the sun, the sun, oh gosh, I'll remember it. I'll remember his name in a minute. 
<laughs> but anyway, these hearkening back to this er to early uh, um, botanical still lives. Talbot Smith. Okay, so he's hearkening back to that sort of 19th century photographer. I call this flower eroticism. It's fantastic work. It is not meeting its reserve. It, the bid right now is 16K. It won't sell unless it meets its reserve. So, but right now it's being offered for 16K. Uh, and we see- Elizabeth, who, who, excuse me, who sets that reserve number? The artist uh, or, the, or the gallery? Well, if you were the artist and you were selling, well, Maple thorpe has gone, but if you were, the, the gallery, start, galleries don't sell at auction. Well, the auction, wherever it is, who who's setting that reserve price? Yeah. So, but you bring up an inter interesting point. Why do galleries do? Why do they not sell at auction? Galleries don't get their stable of artists and say, "Here, you know, go go and and, rep and be represented at auction." The reason is because there's two price points. There's an auction price point and there's a gallery price point. Galleries are more. And I I say to people when they say, "Well, that's ridiculous. Why doesn't everybody buy at auction?" Because the gallery offers something special. It offers the, the guarantee of authenticity. Auctions do not. Uh, and who sets the reserve? It's the seller. So these are all have all been owned previously. And the sellers are setting the reserve. And I just told you that reserves are no longer at extant after COVID, but these are such important artists that sometimes auctions will cave and to, they'll cave to the seller and say, yeah, we'll give you a reserve. So, so, so if they don't make the reserve, then what happens to this piece? Do they bring it back in another year and do it again? To, to very try good to question. Very good question. And it goes to value. That very question goes to value. First of all, they'll make a decision whether or not there was enough flutter about it Okay, so let me explain. This is right now, the last bid is 16K. Let's say that the auction market is value, and I didn't look up at the, uh, I didn't do the research on the value independently of what the um, auction house, what Artnet was setting the value. But let's say this is a piece that the art world has sold before for 30,000. And let's say it's only meeting 16K and it's not gonna make its reserve they're going to pull this piece forever. They're going to say, this is not uh, showing a good trajectory. Let's say the, um, the bids get up to 29K. And the previous, because uh, remember, this is an ed addition of 30. Let's say the previous um, sa sale uh, of this same image sold for, 29, uh, sold for 30, and now they've got a bid of 29. They can make a decision if the reserve is 30. They can drop it slightly, but they can also make the decision to sell it again. And what we call in the auction world as the kiss of death is to offer non-virgin material and they call it non-virgin. So if this has been offered one month, now let's say it's gonna be offered the next month and it's gonna be a dog the next month, it's gonna die, It'll, it won't sell. And so, um, you have to be very careful as the auctioneer and as the auction house to make that decision. And it's all based on what, uh, what the action has been. And, 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 um, and, if, and if they think it can be offered in that year in another sale, they will. But many times the seller gets cold feet and says, I want it back. And they will pay a restocking fee because the auction, once you sign that contract, they're going to sell it unless you come up with a, a restocking fee and you, it's a tough world, but it's, it's really beneficial if you're an artist to try your hand at, at an auction because it's the fastest way to become a listed artist. To it's just amazing to me that, you know, a piece, you know, they, they, you know, it, it sold at 30,000 before, they get a they get a bit of twenty nine thousand and they're going to pull it. I mean, wouldn't you rather have twenty nine thousand than nothing? I mean, depends on how no, it depends on how the contract reads. If the contract says we we're going to absolutely uh, our reserve is thirty, and if we don't make thirty, we're going to pull it. The, and 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 it there's a lot of value determinants here. It's a small addition. It's a deceased artist. It's a famous work. 
you know, all these things go into the decision process. 16K is low for this piece. And now they know it. And so, um, no, a lot of cases, sellers balance. It's a good question. They said in their mind, well, it's not going to be virgin material when it comes back. But when it comes back, I might have a better market. So mm -hmm. they kind of they, they kind of weigh that. They use people like me to weigh that. What we do, appraisers do, or at least certified appraisers like I, we look at the whole trajectory of this image. And we say, oh, yeah, there's been flux fluctuations in this kind of market. Um, and it, it happens to be a strong market now. It happens to be a very strong market for multiples. That's anything in, a, in addition, whether it be lithography, woodcuts, photography. It's a, it's a strong market for, for addition pieces. And that's because this is a weird phenomena. You, won't, you guys probably won't believe me when I tell you this, but it's because additions are easily purchased without seeing them in person. What I mean by that is, let's say this is an addition of, well, it is, it's an addition of 30. I know where all the other 29 are because they're all in museum collections or private collections and it's in Maplethorpe's catalog raisonne. And I look up the catalog raisonne, I say, oh, I know where all 29 are. That is 99% sure that this is an original. Because there's only 30. So you can buy multiples without going to the gallery or the auction, anything. You don't have to see it. You just have to know the addition number in the image. And you can pretty much um, guarantee to yourself authenticity. Over COVID, my celebrity and connoisseur clients were buying a lot of additioned prints, you know, Miro, uh, Calder, et cetera. They were buying a lot because, you know, they, it was a guarantee. They, they know the edition's a closed edition. There's not going to be any more. And they know where the other pieces in that edition are. And so, okay, there, there's no skin off their teeth to, to, to drop 10 grand and buy it because they know it's authentic. Okay, so let's go on. This is Vic Muniz. He's a Brazilian artist born in 1961. It's the next down, Mike. This is called Haystack 4. I think it's wonderful. It's after Monet. It's from his series called Pictures of Color. Look at this. His series was started in 2001. It's a chromogenic print, so it's a C print. And it's Monet's Haystack reproduced with Pantone chips. Once he does that with his Pantone, you can see the gradations of Pantone here. Once he does that with the um, Pantone, he photographs and enlarges uh, the piece. So it's very large. It's 72 by 90. It's signed and dated. And it is number three in an edition of three. Okay. The current bid on Artnet sales is 29K. And there is a note that says the reserve is met. There's also a note that says there's been five competitors already. And so this is going to heat up in the next two days. Uh, what do we have here as far as val um, value determinants? We have a very unique medium. We have a very important young artist. Um, we have an important reference in art history. We have a really atmospheric approach. Uh, we have a large scale, which sometimes can work to an advantage when you've got something like this. It, 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 it shows so well large. Um, what other value characteristics can you think of in such a thing? Uh, I can tell you that this artist does in this series, he does other famous works of, of fine art, but he doesn't do all Pantone trips. He'll do like, for example, with impressionist work, he'll do like fabric swatches because he's trying to imitate the brush strokes and the textures. So really creative medium uh, artists in, in, various, in various collage mediums, even we can say. So some value characteristics. Number four, okay, let's move down to number four. This is Nan Golden. American artist born uh, 1953, Jimmy Paulette and Taboo undressed in New York City, 1991. 
It's 39 by 26. It's signed. It's number two in an edition of 25. Uh, she was a very famous artist in New York. She covered the gay community, the trans, uh, the um, drag community. Extremely sympathetic to the communities there. And uh, some of her work is, uh, no, is it document or is it art? I mean, it's both really, isn't it? So let's look at why this is important. Well, of this work, the artist said, here we go to provenance again. Isn't this, isn't this remarkable what she said? She said, to shoot is not detachment, but it's touching someone, it's caressing. And a photographer, she continues, a photographer can give a subject access to the subject's or the sitter's own soul. So very sympathetic in 1991, where such images were not as um, accepted. And certainly the sentiment of touching and caressing not as accepted. Uh, right now it's at 7,500 and the reserve is not met. So uh, suffice to say, we don't know if this is going to be considered vintage photography because the 90s, I don't know if it's considered vintage yet, but vintage <laughs> photography would be what you're laughing. The 90s, yeah, but um, um, John's, John's laughing over there. And so the 90s, uh, we don't know, but anyway, the reserve is not met. Let's go to the next one, Cindy Sherman. Super interesting work. Uh, this is her work called Untitled, 1975. She was a young student when she shot this of herself. It's very small, it's seven by five inches. It's signed, it's in an edition of 100. It's, it's, a, it's a printed, it, uh, it, this is a silver gelatin print, which is printed later. So she shot it in 1975 and it's printed later in 1995 from the same, no, 1999, from the same negative. And uh, it's presently at 9,000 and the reserve is not met. And you're going to ask me, is it beat up on purpose? And I'm gonna tell you it is not beat up on purpose because she's working out her composition. And these are from the negative that she's scratching the negative here. So she's putting points of the composition uh, because she's a student at the time. So why this is an important value characteristic is because it's one of the first examples of Cindy Sherman shooting herself in costume as a student. Yeah. 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 Oh, John's po pointing out the fact that I did a whole estate of, of Cindy Sherman, um, of a woman here in, in Santa Barbara who donated it, uh, donated to the Getty and to Albrecht Knox Museum uh, in Buffalo, all her Cindy Shermans. And so I got really uh, involved with, with this, uh, this artist. Number six, let's do our last one here and then I wanna open the floor for questions and, and comments. This is Richard Prince, American artist, 1949. This is called Untitled from Upstate, 1998. Signed in an edition of eight, just at the color on Kodak paper, nothing special. Okay, opening bid was 5,500. Well, it didn't say whether or not the reserve was met. I assume it was um, because they didn't say if it was, it was not met. And um, why is this important? Well, uh, usually not, Louis, let's look at the date, 1998. And usually um, what we have when it's sort of the first or it's a theme that's first in its presentation, it makes difference in the market because it's starting something. Well, what is the, what did Richard Prince start with the uh, images like this? Well, we see it's called upstate New York. Okay, so on one side, we have a very New York, upstate New York kind of, I don't know if you're familiar with upstate New York, but I am, and that looks like upstate New York, the lighting, the trees, et cetera. And then you've got the woodstocky things going on here to the left. He was famous for what we call approbation art. So he would steal images and make them into his own art. And um, 
so he's stealing images, uh, even of, of his own images, you know, maybe he shot the tree and the basketball thing and the little tree going on. Maybe he shot that, maybe he shot the nudes, we don't know, but he, he, he steals images. Um, and he became famous for stealing images in a time when it, it was, what are you laughing about? Right, it was okay to steal images. That's right. Now it's it now. Yeah, John's remarking that. Yeah. And, but um, so this is a work. It's 20 by 24. Opening bid 5,500. They're not, it hasn't been met yet, that bid. So here again, the value characteristics of such a thing. There's some shock value here, but there's also the value that he's kind of the first artist to fool around really big time with the legalities of copyright issues and approbation and stealing other artists' work. And that's a hot topic today. So that's gonna make a difference in the valuation. Oh, John- You know, Elizabeth, I, I, I just have to say, that, that, that's horrible. I mean, the picture on the left, I mean, what is that? I mean, who can, you know, it's the color is terrible, the subject is <laughs> terrible, the whole, re I mean, I'm sorry, I wouldn't give you a nickel for that picture. And I don't understand why people are paying five thousand dollars for that. I don't get it's, it. It's I don't get it. Okay, uh, let me explain. Do <laughs> it's the con, and I'm not the expert on on approbation art, but it's the concept that Richard Price came up with to say I am going to steal images and cause a big stir, and the images that I'm going to steal are going to be some crummy images and some really interesting images, but I'm going to steal images, and that concept is going to be my work of art. It's a concept. Whatever you it's say, Elizabeth, I'm just shaking my head. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Well, I'm telling you what, you know, uh, what would be written up in the catalog, uh, you know, uh, it would be a, 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 an important work of art for its concept. Uh, right now, there's a big legal brouhaha over contract, multiple uh, contract, artist rights, um, um, uh, the court cases uh, uh, coming out, music, photography, uh, all the art forms, who steals what, why? How is it stolen? Is it stolen to, to create on another platform? You know, so he's juxtapositioning a collage imagery here that's saying, I'm up, I'm in upstate New York and there's like a really boring life up here, but there's some really interesting, uh, kinky, weird people up here too. And it's all a concept because I'm stealing it all. I, I get what he's trying to say. Now, whether or not it's your taste, you want to hang it over the couch. That's another question. <laughs> Right. So um, I don't think so. <laughs> no, but okay. I mean, it, it's important because it's 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 breaking new ground as far as an artist who comes from the world of advertising, which he did. And he said, I'm going to use these images of clip art and just go to town and it's all going to be photography. So uh, very interesting. Um, so uh, I want to open up the floor and I want to hear what people have to say. Um, when uh, um, I'm at a very fancy event, let's say, and there's a um, portrait photographer and um, the, 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 the host is paying a lot of money for a very high-end portrait photographer to shoot the event, um, people say to the host, why are you doing that? I mean, aren't, your, aren't all our cell phones just as good? So... I've got a bunch of, how many do I have? I have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I have 16 professional photographers, 15, uh, with John is 16. And so I wanna throw out th this question. Uh, what myths do people tell themselves that um, I'm just as good as you? I'm just as good as you. What do you hear about that? Well, after seeing that last picture, um, <laughs> that's a pretty tough one right there. I think it, it's the photographer. I don't think it's what you use because I know a guy that, um, Dan Burkholder, that does pretty much iPhone 
photography teaches it and his work is amazing so I not, I, yeah so so you misunderstand me i'm not talking about the camera because the latest iphones have just as good a camera what what is it yeah. i mean john's got go ahead oh, can i may i just say it reminds me of 40 years ago when i was in driver's ed and and they they told me that nine out of ten drivers think they're a really good driver and i thought that's probably the same about cell phone photos as you know nine out of ten are not good but they all think they're good i know so it's it's exactly so the so the the parity in in photographic machinery between like an iphone and and what john's got for example um and what you guys all have I'm not talking about that because they are, they're getting equal. They're equalizing. They really are as far as their capacity. What I'm talking about is why should I hire a professional photographer? Why should I even buy professional photography? Why should I, when, you know, I, I think I'm pretty damn good on my cell phone. Why, why should I buy a work of a professional photographer? Um, what are, what are some of the myths that you hear? The myth by the person with the iPhone, or the myth by the person who's got the good cap, the better, the the well purportedly better camera. Okay, I'm talking about this. Let now. Here's the answer to my question, and I, I was trying to make you think about this, which is, you guys have experience in composition, in color harmony, in hue, in value, in the content being meaningful, laden with interest in all the technical end once it's out of your camera, whether your camera be an iPhone or a, a what, what you, what's your camera? Sony, yeah, Nika, uh, Nika, whatever you've got. It's you. So it's the artist. Now, what I want to say is, Yes, the art photography world and the PPA world are different universes from Elizabeth. Exactly. But the but the fact is that there's still a soul behind a trained soul behind whatever camera you're using, no matter what world of photography you're in. You can say, well, you know, the lithographic world is very different from the oil painting world. And it's true. But the idea is that there is a mediating soul behind the art artistry, whether it be PPA, whether it be uh, art photography, et cetera. And I don't think that the casual party goer with an iPhone is thinking through the kind of discipline that you guys have. That was Elizabeth, that is very true. However, some of these people that are looking at the pictures don't see the difference between what they're shooting with their little iPhone mm -hmm very in an unconstructed way and what the quote unquote us professional photographers who may have had a background in all these things have put, have, have put the thought into it and we can see the difference in tonality we can see whether it's a in focus or out of focus and these other folks it's lost on them it's lost on them and so to their point why don't you hire a professional photographer so well, I, I, it's a very important question, and it's one that we're all dealing with today. What do you want to say? People that buy the last piece of art and want to take some photos. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want to address that. Uh, if, um, first of all, you're speaking to an appraiser, and what, what, why, you know, why I'm, uh, I got put on earth to do what I do. Uh, I think is because I'm not looking at the present. I'm looking at values that are way in the past. You know, I'm looking at um, works of art that, you know, are sometimes 16th century. Uh, and I am looking at them um, through the eyes of connoisseurship. And so is the, the, the so is that their appropriate market. And so, one thing that appraisers do constantly is remind folks that you you have an appropriate market because you have gone through that training and because you have that experience. So your appropriate market may not be the people who don't see uh, what you see, what, who don't see as well. 
we can talk for hours about visual literacy. Some people have it. You guys all have it. Many people that may, that you run into may not have it, but your market are those that have it. And your market in the future will be those that have it. Okay, final question. Before, on uh, Elizabeth, so to, to your point of um, the consumer here is someone who appreciates you're selling to that, but in the art that you're in selling and whether it's contemporary or older, I mean, it's, it's like, is that market, do you see that market shrinking? I mean, you said, you know, Christie's had a, a net of or gross of 7.3 billion, <laughs> but, but on the other hand, you know, from the professional photographer's view of the world, um it, it's 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 a tough world out there where the discerning uh consumers are fewer and farther between right right well but the thing is i'm not the marketing expert i know your markets i know markets because if i didn't know markets i couldn't do my job so i know the levels of market that i'm going to to find value but what i'm also suggesting to you is that there's there's actually two um two levels of consumers here. Number one is the consumers that you've got to have to keep the bread on the table as artists. But number two, there's the consumer that's way down the line. That's 150 years down the line, let's say. And that the work that, you know, that, you know, you, you may have, uh, so, so, so there's really two essential. And I guess what I'm hearing you say is, uh, I understand what you're saying. It's really difficult to satisfy both because obviously we have to keep bread on the table, but at the same level, uh, I I think that that this despair over, um, you know, uh, what 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 Bonnie was saying, we we may not be taken uh, as seriously by people who don't understand visual literacy the way we do. And that's going to be true. That's just going to be true. Um, but I think the question goes to how to reach the people who who might appreciate someone's work, right? Well, okay, so for the first, my first comment about that is how to reach the people is how to develop a reputation in the market. And how to develop a reputation in the market is to become... <clears throat> in some measure, a listed artist, whether or not you do that via representation at auction, representation at a gallery sale, and therefore you, you see your art offered for sale on such platforms as Mutual Art and Artsy if you're uh, working with the gallery, or if you're, you're representing at an auction, you're, you're lucky enough to, to get some work in at auction, that's public knowledge and it's total track record. And it's sort of like when you read somebody's resume and you know, your, their resume say, says, well, you know, but for example, mine, I was at Tufts University, was magna cum laude, then I was at USC, then I, had, then I did a doctorate, et cetera. So you're saying to yourself, well, there's a track record here that she probably is fairly educated. And likewise, if you have this standpoint, the standpoint in the market as being sold in markets that record the sales, you you have the status. Right then and there, you can say to a client, oh, by the way, my work is in collection X. It was sold by X, da, 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 da. It's, it, 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 it matters. It matters to the art world. It matters, uh, we were talking about that, how to, how to get into those markets. How do you get into those markets? Well, you, you, uh, you become represented is number one, either auction, art fairs, uh, or galleries, you you publish uh, and uh, pu I, not publish is the right word, but you put out there with your client's permission whose collections you're in, who has purchased you, um, who has commissioned you, uh, the kind of work that you are are known for, the people you've spoken to, shows you've juried, uh, the shows you've been juried in, etc. All these things. You, you're building a market because the market is based, I got to tell you, you guys already know this. 
The market's based on what someone's going to pay for it. That's the market. And so the idea is, okay, how do, how do you get into the market, even if you don't care about what people pay for your work? Uh, how do you get into that market? Well, you get into that market in the ways I'm telling you in this lecture, just as an example, you, you, beco you become part of the market. You know, you become part of the auction world. You become part of the gallery world. You become part of the art fair world. You, you, you pay for a booth in, in a Biennale or a fair. You know, you try your hand at that, et cetera. And then you publicize the <clears throat> heck out of it, you see. And so that's one way to look at establishing a market record. Getting into a market takes the cachet of having conquered a former market. This one market, let's say it was a, it was a nice sale that was had for me at a local gallery, but now I'm going on to a more international platform, let's say. The other thing that I would say might right off the bat, one of the most effective ways, and I've helped a number of artists do that, do this, is to have a museum show. As small as it is, have a museum show, become known in a museum's catalog, let's say, or even a museum's guide that they publish for the event. Let's say, okay, um, who did we represent at a museum? Um, we have Web Santi Fazali, for example. Uh, Santi, I, I helped Santi get a show at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. It was a life retrospective show. Uh, but, you know, hit the sales of his work increased, his market increased greatly because the museum show, here again, you're looking for stepping stones up uh, to form a reputation. Reputation equals money, unfortunately. Uh, you know, and, and people are like, well, you know, you understand art, but you also are, you're so, you're such a mercenary, Elizabeth. Uh, no, I'm, I'm using the idea that this is, you know, this is the way appraisers work. It's basically, I'm appraising for a certain value and there's certain value characteristics. A museum show can be as small as the local historical society. Uh, who, who did we put in um, Laguna? Um, um, the, the lady that had that fabric store, her, her parents were photographers. We put her in Laguna, uh, a, a little museum, a tiny museum. Um, uh, right now, uh, we're working with somebody, uh, Simon Roycroft, who has a collection of Civil War swords and photographs. We're trying to get him a show at the Maritime Museum. Uh, you, you, you get that show, and boy, you got a lot going on. Mm hmm you see, so so your question, Mike, about here, you know, what, okay, Elizabeth, it's one thing to say, well, um, yeah, you, you know, you, 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 you need a market. And it's another thing to say, how do you get into that market? Well, some of those tricks I'm, I'm sharing that I know how people use, the big one is um, a museum, even if it's a group show. A group show, you know, pitch a group show idea to a local gallery or a small museum, uh, have a theme show. Channel Islands uh, Historical Society used, um, what's it name, the guy that was, um, oh, now I'm forgetting, fine art photographer from the 1920s. He happened to shoot a lot of the Channel Islands. I had a woman who had one of his works. Remember the the, the dancer with the big hoop, the food, big hoop? And I had, um, uh, that was a, a photographer who, yeah, I can't remember the name. It'll come to me in a minute, but he, um, uh, we sold that for a lot of money because we were able to say, well, it's been in this museum show and it raises the cachet of the artist. Finally, um, I wanted to leave 15 minutes for, for, um, for, for break, uh, questions. Um, do I have any comments from my esteemed colleagues here? What are the trends for the future uh, and other uh, image platforms? This is a loaded question. Um, Getty images, stock photos, uh, AI, um, uh, it, you name it. What, what's the future? Uh, what's the future for multiples? What's the future for copyright? What's the future for artists' rights? Uh, what's the future? How do you take this, the, this, the, the, um, the benefits of what is offered to you in the future regarding 
this total confusing world between multiples and uh, approbation. Um, how do you take that and 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 make that and own it? Um, how how do you nego how do you how do you negotiate that that world coming that any thoughts on that and then I want to save the last fifteen minutes or so of this hour uh, for questions to me any any comments on future the future in image making well one of one of the things that's really clear is um, there there are two different kind of threads going on right now and especially in the AI world right, where there's the approach um, and the open source approach of, I'm gonna troll the internet and pick up images and I'm gonna use them and they're mine to use. And then there's sort of the approach that Adobe's taking, which is, well, you put it in our collection and you can, um, every all of the creators have access to it and you'll get paid a small commission on the use of it as as a component so i think it's interesting adobe's taking that approach of retaining copyright and enforcing copyright on the side of the 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 uh, creator where the open world is like doesn't matter we don't care um whatever is out there is ours to use right right so um, I want to just bring up two things. Uh, <clears throat> I did an estate in Malibu. It was a fire damage. And we were going to sue the utility company. Um, and this was an amazing estate where the family had um, four generations of uh, uh, rabbis in the family. They had rabbinical um, chants and films of prayers in, in, in specific dialects that were gone. They lost them all in the fire, four generations. And um, a certain Hasid, Hasidim level, mm -hmm. amazing, uh, uh, so treasured, no copies. So uh, I tried to find on Getty Images, I try as an appraiser to say, okay, now I can find this um, similar. I can find some chance of this particular sect. I can find the chance. I can find a few. I can find what it costs to rent that in in a for a certain thing, right? For if it's for education, it's one thing. If, if it's for um, a, a, a paid film, it's another. If it's for you know Hollywood, it's another charge. You know how Getty Images work. So I'm, I'm trying to get a market level based on Getty images. That's one factor is that um, even though it's a, there's copyright involved like Adobe and Getty and, and what do you use? That's what the other one? Lightroom or Light, Adobe. Yeah, okay, um, Lightroom. And so there's uh, other platforms, but the issue is that the, um, the value is key to the type of use in many cases, and it's really difficult to, to just as as uses as uses merge. Secondly, I myself have an experience with Getty Images. So when I first, uh, this is a number of years ago, I I, I had a, a woman that I thought, oh, this is good. I'll have a lady do my web design, and she's inexpensive, and she's you know she's okay. Um, and so I, I pay her. I said, here's here's my information. I want the following things on my on my um, website. And uh, she came up with this, you know, really pretty masthead. You know what a masthead is, right there. A little pretty masthead. I said, oh, that's kind of nice. Um, yeah, let's let's use that. Let's use some of these other images, etc. I get a phone call from Getty's lawyers. You owe us sixty seven thousand dollars. I said, what? They have these regular investigative machineries that kind of look to see what you're using. My uh, web designer said, you know, I, I assumed it was open source. No, you're using it to garner business for your client. Now you owe 67000 Totally blindsided. 
because I have a background in uh, copyright versus value, et cetera, and, and I, I'm supposed to know these things. Well, I speak to an attorney, attorney says, nothing you can do about it. Uh, they're going to get you. They're just going to get you. You're going to, you need to pay $67,000. So I called them, I called their legal department one Friday at like quarter to five. And I said, listen, I'm understanding I owe you some money, but I want to negotiate. And they said, well, we just don't negotiate. And I said, but I don't have that kind of money. So either you're going to negotiate, or you're not going to get anything. <laughs> so, but the question is, Mike, be careful with what the uses are, what the key, what you're paying for, and open source. Is it really open source? And um, anyway, so now I want to throw it, the, the floor open. I have 10 minutes. Please ask me questions, any questions you might have. I, I have a question, question about estates. You've been talking a lot about estates. And in fact, my wife and I have both your books and my wife just read your No Thanks Mom book, which she enjoyed quite a bit. And um, I'm just wondering, uh, we've gotten you know, quotes for like uh, liquidating an estate where they want 40% to do it. What do you think about that type of thing? Well, first of all, 40% is unheard of in San Barbara where it's 60% okay. to, 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 the, uh, to, to the estate sale folks. So what I would suggest is you look at just, you know, you think about this lecture and think of the concept of different markets. For different material, you have different markets. For let's say you have a, a nice rare book collection. It's not the best, but it's a nice rare book collection. You have a different market than an estate sale. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say let's say you've got good 19th century furniture, which is terrible in the market now. Horrible, terrible. That is an estate sale market. Mm -hmm. Let's say let's say you've got a, a, a nice 19th century landscape by a, a British painter with cows. That's so terrible right now in the market. That's an estate sale market but you've got a nice mid-century modern contemporary lithograph by a fairly, let's say Ben Sean. Well, that isn't even Santa Barbara or Thousand Oaks. That needs to go to San Francisco or Los Angeles or New York. So you pick the market in which you're going to maximize. So, so you almost need an appraisal before you can decide what to do. It depends. You can pay for someone like me. I'm $125 an hour. Mm -hmm. You can pay for someone like me to do an analysis for you. Or you say, Elizabeth, you just come and visit. I do a lot of this, by the way. Uh, you come and visit the house and tell us if it's worth it for you to write a legal appraisal document. Because let's say I say to you, well, the whole estate's going to be worth 10000 And for me to do an analysis, I'm going to charge you 2000 Well, by the time, you know, end of day, you might do better and pay 40% to get the whole estate moved. Yeah. But I yeah. would definitely single out because in, in any estate, this has been 30 years of experience, in any estate, there's the golden, the, the, the golden egg. There's the one thing that's like, oh my God, it, this should not be in this market. This should not be in this estate. This should not be here. We need to go beyond this estate to maximize. So uh, a lot of people just pay me to do an hour walkthrough and just say, okay, here's five things that should not be in an estate sale. And you, you know, that could offset your 40%. Just that's, a great, that's a great comment. Thank you for that. Yeah, and, and a lot of times people do the same, like for example, John was at a house today where he was just shooting for me. And, um, you know, we're going to do a lot of analysis just on the photos. So if you guys, you know, you're professional photographers, if you've got something that you want me to look at, you shoot a whole bunch of things and send them my way. And I can do an analysis without actually being at the house. That's great. That's great. And That's by the way, and by the way, insurance companies now, we were talking a little bit about insurance. I do a lot of, like I said, court work with insurance. They are now allowing, and this could be a, another little niche for you guys. They're allowing distance appraisals. In other words, in the past, I would have to be there and sign an affidavit that I saw these things. 
but now they are not, they don't, uh, so I can send John to any estate and he could shoot that for me. And, and we can, in some cases, ensure, ensure the work just on the strength of the photos. I don't have to sign anything. So um, uh, for both estate work and for insurance work, I can use photos and you can actually um, <coughs> just, just for that purpose. I mean, for how over 10 years, John's been a, an object photographer. He's shot all the great art I look at and all the furniture. I look at all the silver, china, jewelry. You know, he's got all the gear for that really distinct detail work. But he also does whole video walkthroughs where people want to document for their kids and their insurance company, by the way, what they had in the house. Little clue. You were saying fire damage, fire area. I was kind of listening when we first started. My biggest hint to any of the clients, my clients, take a video camera, go through your house one Saturday, get parts of your body in the shots, narrate, tell what you have, go back with your still camera, take photos, still photos of everything in the house in situ. Why, you say, why? Why do you need both video and still? Well, you got a lawsuit in a court in regards to an insurance matter. The two things you have to prove are ownership and location. So I'll give you an example and, and then we'll, we'll, we have another, well, three minutes, but I'll give you another example. I had an estate where it was a woman who had three generations of Tiffany Silver. She hired a professional photographer who had a, a white box. He put each piece of thousands of pieces of Tiffany Silver in a white box. Everything burnt, case of seed of fire. Insurance settlement said, okay, we're not paying you anything. Um, your silver collection, how do we know it was yours? There's no location proven. There's no ownership proven. These are just things in a white box. No location, no ownership. We're not paying. So uh, that's a little bit about insurance, but I mean, that's can not why you asked me. Can you do an update based on a, on a prior appraisal with pictures and everything in it? You can if it's within a certain amount of time. For insurance companies, it's three to five years. And for estates, no, because the, the estate has to be um, valued on the date of death or the date of, uh, let's say, inheritance, if it's a 706, you know, estate filing. Um, so in so, some cases, date specific. It's older than that, but the state farm has been collecting my money every year on the insurance. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna just tell you one thing. Um, uh, I will I will email you, Elizabeth, because I may need your services. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, but, but John's John is. What am I gonna say? Can you can you tell people what I'm gonna say? But the tell us the tell us the. Yeah, I. Okay. So 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 course, John. Of course they are taking your money. Of course they're taking their yeah. So so John, it's it's, it's so funny. I get this quite a bit you know uh, it's not fair because I've been paying the premium now I have to go to court and they're not even going to pay me what my premium is they're going to contest what I say and they're going to make me dot my eyes cross my t's just you know out of date blah 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 and I say to them look around New York San Francisco Chicago who's got the tallest building in any of those cities insurance companies <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Is there a last question, anybody that? Um... Yeah, Elizabeth, I was wondering what your thoughts are on NFTs and how uh -huh. they fit into the appraisal process. Yeah, so so personally speaking, uh, I think that uh, we have the comparison. Are they the Gutenberg Bible uh, of, of, the, of the visual world is one um, question. <clears throat> um, the other thing is that uh, 
they are kind of um, a fad at auction. They are making big money at auction because they targeted a certain market. The market that they've targeted are conspicuous consumers that want to be known as conspicuous and known as big, what do they call it? Um, high dollar consumers, high, high flashy consumers. They want to get their names in the paper for papers and online and on wired, et cetera, for spending as much as they can. That market with crypto falling ha um, has really suffered. Secondly, no gallery owner that I've spoken to is going to want to touch NFTs. Uh, that may change. But you have it. Remember, we're talking about markets. You have a limited market when you have only auction interested. You've got no retail market. Galleries are retail market. Auctions are secondary market. You've got no retail market if galleries don't want to uh, touch NFTs. Our gallery here, Sullivan Goss, uh, I just did a talk for them. Um, it, was on, it was on airship issues, so how to pass art to your heirs. I did a, a talk on the, the, that, that there's a whole legal, I, my, myself and an attorney did a talk on that. And I said to the gallery, there was a question about an NFT similar to yours. And I said to the gallery owner, who's a really good friend of mine, I said, you know, would you like to talk about if you are planning on um, accepting any NFTs into your stable. And he said, they're soulless. <laughs> they're meant to be soulless. Their um, point, their concept is soullessness. That's not what I want to show in my gallery. I want to show art with soul. And so, you, you do have, I don't think they're Luddites either, the gallery owners I'm speaking to. I think they really see something. So people who really look at visual art, who really do have a lot of visual literacy, in some cases, they find them really soulless. Um, so there's, there is a, a certain number of people who are not uh, seduced by the big millionaires that are buying these things that are under 30 years old because they're buying them for the bling of buying them in many cases. But it's a form to be reckoned with. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the picture that Bonnie was talking about, why is it any different? I mean, it's, it's what somebody will pay for it, right? And... Not necessarily because it's the market's conception of what someone will pay for it. So what I've been trying to tell you is this whole lecture is I'm, I'm disavowing you of this of the expression. It's only worth what someone will pay for it. No, it's worth worth what the market turns around and analyzes it to be valued at. And all these value platforms, market platforms that we're talking about, market levels, you know, market techniques, all those uh, market characteristics, connoisseurship, physical properties, provenance, celebrity, all those matter. And so it matters to build a value that way. So it's not what just one person will pay for it, but it's a whole consensus right now because the world is so connected um, and the auctions made it such because basically, especially during COVID, everything was so automated. Everything was computer-based selling. Nobody could go to a gallery opening. Everybody was learning so fast what, uh, what, what markets wanted, what markets uh, how markets set value. Every Ben became very educated very quickly about um, how markets established value. Uh, and you can use experts. You can use experts like me. You can use experts that are in the gallery world. Um, um, you know, that's a really good start for, for retail. You can use people that are in the auction world. Uh, I, I, there's a, a woman that you probably get to um, do a little bio on. I will give you her name. She's at Artnet, and her name is Susanna Weniger. She's the the, uh, the um, curator of contemporary phot photography at Artnet. A very open minded, very interesting woman. Uh, people like that, you know, get the opinion of um, people like that regards to markets. It's not one person anymore. It's not like the people in the auction like this did this, I bid this, he bids that. It's not that world anymore. 
And be, they, when I was at Christie's, it was that way. But now if I go to an auction, there's maybe five people in the audience and 40 people in back with computers on phones. So whole different, whole different universe, whole, and that, and that is the market the, that is, well, um, mo, it, not just one person, it, many, it, and, and it's the, it's the opinion. It's like, um, we have fallen into this idea of the celebrity opinion. So, uh, so somebody's opinion matters, um, at the top of the art food, art food chain, and that passes down to other people in the, in the art food chain. And before you know it, you have the, the photograph that Bonnie despised of <laughs> being, being worth six thousand dollars because and actually it's worth much more than six thousand because somebody has discovered that it was the first of its kind in affirmation art, which was a huge cerebral um, 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 uh, conceptual um, uh, trend. First of its kind is always something. Yeah. Anyway, I better let you guys go. You know my email, Elizabeth Appraisals at gmail.com. Elizabeth, and thank you very much. Yes, thank very you. been very interesting. I had I have no idea, you know, about the whole gallery auction world. And uh you kind of opened that up a little bit for us, and it's it's amazing. <laughs> I mean, all I know about auctions I see on movies, you know, <laughs> where they're doing this, we're doing this. Yeah. Fabulous so, talk. So, so I want to just close by Bonnie. I want to react to that. Auctions are today the social arbiters of value. You're interested in value, even from your own platform. Auctions are today's arbiters of value in the art world. 